Y'all ready? Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. I'm Reverend Brenda. Thank you for being with us on this Spring Forward Sunday. Yes, we are so glad you have joined us. If you are joining us in person, would you please begin to fill out the attendance pads that are located on your row and pass them to your neighbors? If you are joining us online, would you use the platform that has been designated for you to sign in on your attendance? All hymns, responses, and other things will be on the screens here in the sanctuary. On your devices at home, we are having some technical difficulties, and so we ask for your extended grace. We have service opportunities for you to sign up this week. We would love for you to sign up in Wesley Hall. Wesley Hall is open and Serve has a table and we welcome you to serve, sign up for Serve First for Holy Week, which is Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter. We have three services that we need you to serve. 8 a.m., 9.30, and 11 o'clock. All need volunteers. Project Transformation, Neighbor to Neighbor, are just a few opportunities where you can volunteer to serve first. Organ Recital with Peggy Graff and Andy Rose is on Tuesday, March the 21st at 11.30 a.m., and a light lunch will follow in Wesley Hall. Now, would you please stand and join me for our call to worship, followed by our singing. Come, the banquet of hope and praise is ready. Feed on the love of God in Jesus Christ. Be healed by God's gracious mercy. In Jesus' name, you are loved, healed, and forgiven. Amen. Well, hello, everyone. Good morning. Again, welcome here on this Spring Break Sunday. Uh, for those of you that I haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Matt Britt. I'm the director of Youth Ministries here. And this Sunday, um, I'm filling in for Clint. He's out on vacation with his family, taking some much-needed time off. So uh, I'll be leaving you all in worship with Longer the Gathering Band. So this morning, like Brenda mentioned, we do have a few technical difficulties. So the words may or may not be on the screen. Uh, some of these songs you'll know, some of these you won't. Um, but we encourage you all, if you know them, to sing along and join us in worship this morning. Lord, I find you in the seeking. Lord, I find you in the doubt. And to know you is to love you and to know so little else I need you. Oh, 
Make the way bright before me in your light. I will find all I need, all I need is you. Light, glorious light, I will go where you shine. Break the dawn, crack the sky. Make the way bright before me in your light. I will find all I need, all I need is you. the world, but it couldn't fill me, man's empty praise, treasures that fade, are never enough, that you came along, and put me back together. 
I am Pastor Phyllis Barrett, and I am so glad to be here worshiping with you today. And we have the most wonderful, exciting, sacred time ever, and that is when we baptize children. And so at this time, I invite the parents of Luella to come forward. And Big Brother. Yeah, you can come too. Remember these words that Jesus said. Baptism is a sign of God's mercy and love, reminding us that we do not come into this relationship with God on the basis of anything that we do, but rather on God's acceptance and gracious invitation to us. We know that children have a very special place among the people of God. Remember these words that Jesus said, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For such as this belongs to the kingdom of God. Yes, you do. <laughs> All right. Well, parents, I have some questions for you. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, say, I do. I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. I do. And will you nurture Luella in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? I think we all heard the answer. Is that so? If so, say, I do. And now, what is the name that this little girl is receiving? Luella B. Luella B. All right, Luella. How do you feel about just stepping a little bit away from your mommy? I'm going to make sure you still can see her. Oh, my goodness. She is so tiny. Now, Luella, do you want to see this water? Oh, yes. Luella B., I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, will you all please put your hand on Luella? Will you be able to reach her? Yes. Let's say a very short prayer. Luella B., the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of the water and the Spirit, you may grow up to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You are so curious. Now, I have something to show you. Will you be able to look around? Look at that. No, mommy, this just looks more interesting. But do you guys see this baby? Oh, yeah, 
here we go. Now we see this personality coming. Luella, this is your church family. These are the people that are right now accepting you into this community of faith. And they are promising with everything that they have, with their gifts, with their service to support you as you grow up to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, all of you who are wondering, how exactly am I going to do that? You either contact Pastor Brenda or our Mr. Mark Burroughs, who always needs all of you to step up and participate in ministry that helps us to raise these children in Christian faith. Now, go back to mommy, because it's about to get a little loud here. Now, let us welcome Luella with a round of applause. Isn't that just beautiful to baptize children because they're all part of God's family. And now we come to a very special time, and that's the prayers of the people. If we go to God and we express what's on our hearts, we pray for each other, we support each other, we lift up. So as I lift up some names, and then I'm going to have an opportunity where I want you to share names that you're going to lift up. And every time when we go through this process, I'm going to say, Lord, in your mercy, and you're going to say, hear our prayers. Because God is with us. And so when we pray, we know that our God is listening and hearing and knowing everything that's on our hearts. So let's go in prayer. God of mercy, in our impatience for answers, we sometimes turn to idols of our own making and forget our covenant with you. Passionate for what is right, we wrong those who often we differ. Please, at the invitation of your banquet, we fail to arrive with humility and thanksgiving. Forgive us when our faith is weak or our eagerness is too strong. Lord, in your mercy. Father God, the creator of all, your creation testifies about your power, grace, and love. New lives, new hopes, new opportunities, new dreams, for all this, O oh God, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy. Everything that you created, you make free. And over and over again, our freedom is used for the purpose of transgressions, for alienation from you, for violence, for hatred, for greed. And yet, when we're at our worst, you do not abandon us but you join us, come alongside us as Jesus Christ to, to redeem us, to reconcile us, to restore us to relationship with you forever. For this God, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy. Always and everywhere, O Holy Spirit, we are never alone. You come alongside us. You bring us into new experiences of God's grace and peace. For this constant presence of God in our lives, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up today your children, Phil, Mary, Luella, parents of children. Lord, in your mercy. I invite you to say those that are on your heart. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you have heard our prayers with compassion and given us abundance and steadfast love. We give you thanks for your loving arms around us and for giving us peace and hope. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Now at this time, I would like our ushers to start making their way forward. And today I want to lift up to you, and it's just perfect with us having a Uh-oh, there you go. All the ministries for our children. You know, without your generosity, we wouldn't have all the programs that we have for children. 
And part of that goes with Sunday school classes, but we also have a family worship service that's going to be during Lent for everyone. We have the Easter egg hunt, which is coming up, which normally is about six, seven hundred children that come. And then also Vacation Bible School is not far away. All of that is only made possible because of your generous gifts. And I want to thank you for that. So let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious and loving God, take what we have. Let us be generous so that we can bless all the people in this world that need to learn and know you. In Christ's holy name, amen. Good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna read from um, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses one through 14. I'm gonna be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, updated, and I invite you to read along in your own Bibles, or you can use the Pew Bible in front of you. It'll be on page 21 in the Pew Bible. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I prepared dinner, my oxen and fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything's ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it, and they went away one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized the slaves and mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to the slaves, Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and they gathered, gathered all whom they could find, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man who was not wearing a wedding robe, and he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without, wearing, without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. God speaks to us through the reading of scripture. Thanks be to God. Julie for reading to us the scripture today. Um, my name is Jenny, I'm one of the associate pastors here. And uh, uh, before we get into the weeping, the gnashing of teeth, the utter darkness, or the destruction of the entire city, whichever one caught your attention, I want to give special thanks to our AV team today, the volunteers and the staff. About an hour before the worship service started, their words were that uh, everything seems to be super broken. And uh, as you can see, they were able to pull it off, they were able to fix it, and I'm so grateful that we here in the sanctuary and people who worship with us online are able to participate in this experience without any kind of interruptions. So thank you so much. I don't know what kind of miracle you did there, but it's all working great. Now, before we get into the scripture, and I do promise you that we will go through it, I'm not going to shy away from any of those verses that may have made you feel very uncomfortable. Uh, before that, I want to um, mention a few words about um, this person uh, whose uh, biography I've been reading recently. Uh, it's a philosopher, Soren Kierkegaard. Um, now, I'm pronouncing his name the way I learned to pronounce it in Russia, so if that's not how you pronounce it, well, you're stuck with this version for today. <laughs> and maybe after the worship service, you can practice with me the text and pronunciation of his name. So that's a 19th century philosopher. And I remember my first experience with him in college where he lost my attention somewhere between pages 5 and 10 of his very impressive work. Uh, couldn't get through, barely passed the class, wasn't great. But I stumbled upon his story of his life, and uh, it's amazing how the story of someone's life sometimes is so much more interesting than some of the writings that they left. So he grew up uh, in Copenhagen in a family of a Lutheran pietist, and uh, the childhood in that home was very difficult. The problem was that his dad truly believed that their family is cursed. And that, that firm belief that was part of his faith that basically leaked into everything that he did with his family and how he raised the children. All of that made the experience of growing up in a Christian home very different than from what some of you may know. So um, his father would take the, the sons uh, and uh, they would, he would take them to a cemetery. And as they were at the cemetery, he would just preach basically to them about the suffering of Christ and about how horrible their own sins were. The father was uh, absolutely certain and taught his children as well that they all will die by the age of 33 because that was the age of Christ when he died. That was the kind of a Christian home environment where uh, Soren Kierkegaard grew up. Now, my childhood was very different. 
However, when I was reading those pages, I felt like I knew somewhat what this young man was feeling at the time. Now, I grew up in a church where this text and similar texts from the Gospels were preached on a regular basis. I probably have heard a dozen sermons preached from this particular scripture. And I remember, I don't remember exactly the words or the examples or the stories. There were no jokes, by the way. My church, we didn't joke. Uh, we didn't laugh either. There was no clapping. I think the only bodily response that was allowed was very slight nodding. <laughs> All right? No amens, Sister Brenda, none of that. Okay, we were very, very careful about how we responded to what God was doing in our midst. So as I was sitting there, and I don't remember the details, but I remember how I felt in the sanctuary where I spent my teenage years. There was a lot of guilt. There was some fear, because we did not shy away from any of those words. And that guilt and fear that no matter how hard I try, whenever that judgment point will happen, somehow I will not measure up. And then as I sat with that thought over and over again, I also looked at the backs of people in front of me, especially the ones that were doing the very slight Russian Baptist nodding. And just by looking at their backs, not knowing a single thing about their life or their faith, just looking at their backs and those nods, I started feeling jealous, thinking that, well, now these are the people that will make it. These are the people that will have the appropriate attire and appearance of a Christian life when God is going to do that kind of a judgment that we just read about. All of those feelings were part of my Christian faith. And as I read this text uh, uh, this week preparing for the sermon, I told myself, I'm going to preach a sermon that I have not heard before, but I wish I did. So let's walk through this scripture. First of all, those separations that we have in the Bible where the chapters start, those were inserted much later for us to basically find our way around the Scripture. And uh, if you just look up a couple of verses before we started to read, you will see who Jesus was talking to. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. Now, where are they? Jesus already arrived to Jerusalem. He did his triumphant entry as people were celebrating his arrival, but he knew exactly what path laid ahead of him in just a few days. He goes to the temple and he sees that the temple practices of worshiping God and prayer and praise were drowned in the activity all around the temple that had nothing to do with God, so he cleanses the temple. Now, that upset a lot of people. If you have ever been involved in the church, have you ever tried to move furniture around someone's Sunday school class? Okay, now those are the old church people here that, that have been around a while. You know you don't do that. Now Jesus cleanses the temple. He upsets all kinds of people, especially people who were in charge of that temple. And so then when Jesus comes back to the temple, they approach him and they ask him, by what, by what authority you do all of this? Who are you? Who you think you are by doing all these things? And then Jesus replies to them in a series of three parables. And the ones that we read today is one of those parables. So Jesus is not saying these words, these words of tough love to people that are gathered in thousands on the hillside of the Galilee waiting to hear the good news that he is ready to preach to them. He's not telling these words to his disciples, to that group of faithful people that followed him through Galilee all the way to Jerusalem, that abandoned their lifestyles, that abandoned their families just to be close to him. He's not even saying these words to the apostles that he handpicked 
for a very specific ministry that is going to change their lives and the lives of so many people around them. That's not who he is talking about. He is talking to people who have power and authority, who are questioning him, and who are also, as they are talking to him, planning his execution. And he knows it. And so he has some tough words to tell them. It is very important for us to remember about it because <clears throat> when the parable starts, it may be very hard for you to find yourself in it. What am I supposed to connect with? Which one of, this, which one of these verses is talking to me today? If you felt that way, it's because it's not talking to you. It's talking to a very specific group of people, especially the very first part. When the king has a wedding banquet and the king also invites everybody who is supposed to be at the banquet by the social and cultural standards, people knew who would be invited to the royal banquet. And so, as the king invites everyone who is supposed to be there, they don't come. Have you ever heard of that? No, this parable is bizarre. This parable is unbelievable. This parable is not the parable that describes everyday life and everyday experiences of people. This parable is meant to shock you from the very beginning. The people don't show up for a royal banquet. What does the king do? He sends another invitation. Oh, what a lesson on God's grace. Even people who are supposed to be there, when they don't show up, the king extends just one more invitation. Now the response is the same, even worse. The messengers, the slaves that, God, that the king sends are killed. And so if, the, if uh, um, Verse 7 was the first verse that shocked you and upset you. And you sat there and you thought, I don't know what to do with that. Let's walk through it. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burnt their city. Whoa, where did that come from? We started so well with grace and with just one more invitation, and now we are burning the city. Where is that coming from? I'm going to give you a little tidbit of historical information that may help you understand why these words are in this scripture. Now, the author of the gospel probably had a firsthand experience of the city of Jerusalem being burned down and the temple destroyed by the Romans in the year 70. And if he didn't have a first-hand experience, he definitely have heard enough and he has met enough people to relay what it was like to see the city burn, to see the temple being destroyed one more time. It has happened in the past. In fact, most of our Hebrew Bible scriptures in the Old Testament are influenced and reflect on that moment when the first time Jerusalem burnt and the temple was destroyed. And throughout the prophets, throughout the scriptures of the Hebrew Bible, the only explanation that made any sense was that God has continuously reached out to his people, inviting them to live the faithful life, showing them the way of grace and the love and the forgiveness and the justice giving them more and more opportunities, but people willfully were turning away. And as a result of that intentional unfaithfulness, Jerusalem burned and the temple was destroyed. And so, of course, the writer of the gospel has no other explanation for what he already has experienced. It hasn't happened in Jesus' life yet, but he has experienced the destruction of that city. So yes, in the Bible, when the continuous response to God's grace and love is continuous intentional rejection and continuous intentional attempts of finding other gods, other ways to worship, those do lead to disastrous outcomes. 
That is where that verse is coming from. So yes, it's hard for us to connect the dots. Now, once we get to verse 8, that is where I invite you to start inserting yourself into that parable. Start inserting yourself there. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Whoa, what an image of a kingdom of God. What an image of God's grace reaching out to all in such a powerful way that all are brought into that banquet hall. All are celebrating, good and bad, everyone is. Now, who were those people? I do ask you to use your holy imagination. Just stay in that banquet hall. Who are the people around you? The ones that were found randomly on the streets, in the alleys, under the bridges, in the bypasses. All kinds of people. Some have come straight from a whole day of work. Some may have experienced homelessness, probably a whole lot of them. From my studies of the life of, in the cities uh, of uh, um, ancient Mediterranean world, the streets were always filled with beggars. Always, because there was nowhere else for them to go. And everyone ends up at that banquet hall. Now hold that image. Hold that image of all of those people in there. But when the king came in to see the guests, the king wants to see the banquet hall full. The kingdom of God is not supposed to be empty. It's supposed to be filled filled with all kinds of people. So the king is there. The king wants his presence to be there in a powerful way. So he comes in, he looks at all of these people, and he notices one man who was not wearing a wedding robe. Let's pause here. What was everybody else wearing? Are you telling me that all of those people that were just grabbed and invited right there from the streets, from the alleys, from under the bridges and bypasses, they all had in their backpacks, you know, just in case they have a robe that's, you know, uh, appropriate for a royal banquet? No. No. Gosh, I'm thinking about my own wardrobe. I mean, I can pull off business casual, all right, but... You start inviting me to this cocktail and 5 p.m. stuff, you know what, oh, the choices get slim. <laughs> what is everybody else wearing? Now, from the question that the king asks, we know that the man is standing out. In fact, he's the only one, it looks like. So it's everybody else is wearing what is appropriate for a royal banquet. Where did they get that stuff? Was there a sale going on on the store right outside of the palace? No. The only reasonable explanation that I have for it is that the king was providing those robes freely. So that when people came into the royal palace and saw that banquet that they have never even experienced or imagined, they knew by getting a robe and dressing yourself appropriately, they knew that this is a place where I should be. This is a place where I belong. This is a place prepared for me. Every single detail of it, even the robe that I'm supposed to wear. So what the king is asking the man is not, how did you get here without the robe? The king is asking the man, why did you choose to keep your rags? Why did you choose to refuse the robe? We don't know the answer. Did the man think that, hey, I got an invitation, but must be a mistake. I don't belong here. Or did he think, you know what? The banquet will be over. They will take this robe away. 
and somebody's going to go away with my old cloak, and I'll have nothing left, so I'm just going to hold on to what's mine. Or did he think, you know what, this banquet is great. I'll hang out here for a while, maybe eat a good dinner. But honestly, the only way I know is the way I've been living, and that's where I want to go back to. And that's my work suit, or those are my begging rags that help me in what my old life is like, and it is not going to change with this strange invitation and this experience of this gracious banquet that doesn't make sense to me. Why did he choose to keep the old rags? That is what God is asking. Now we're getting back into something that's hard for us to grasp. Verse 13. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping, weeping and gnashing of teeth. First thing that I struggle with is that the king gives the order. The king gives the command. Now, are you with me? Is this the kind of God that you believe in? Is your experience of God's grace and love and forgiveness fits into an image of God who is like a king ordering somebody to be thrown out? Not mine. It used to be. It used to be where all of that made sense to me, but not anymore. Because I have done a lot of work of reflecting on my own faith and listening to other people's stories of faith. And that's not the God I know. So hold that tension for just a little bit longer where it does not make sense. And what we're going to do is we're going to think about what is it that we are reading? Are we reading Jesus' theological reflection on forgiveness and salvation? Jesus sat down and said, I'm going to write a volume that explains absolutely everything just the way it is. No. What we are reading is a bizarre parable that doesn't make sense from its very beginning. So could we allow this parable to have details that are holding the story together that may not make sense to you theologically? Could this command of the king be there to carry on the story to the next very important point that we make and not necessarily reflect the truth of God's character. When you are faced with those kind of decisions reading the scripture, and yes, there are some scriptures that are very confusing. When you are faced with those kind of scriptures, I invite you to reflect on the whole Bible. What is it that you know about God? I invite you to think about your own experience of living as a Christian person who relies on their faith. I invite you to think about the stories and the traditions of the church, the way they have experienced God for centuries. What do we choose to celebrate in the old hymns and the songs and the prayers that have survived centuries? Do we choose to celebrate this kind of God? So hold that tension because maybe it is not supposed to make sense just like the rest of this bizarre parable that does not make sense like people not responding to an invitation of God to come to the banquet. <clears throat> now, let's focus on this other part of the verse, the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When I was growing up, I was told that there is a very specific meaning to those words. This is one of two options that you get once you die. And in a split second, God looks at your attempts to live a Christian life, and that kind of a God makes a decision that defines your eternity. And one of the two options is this. That's how I grew up. That's what I've been told. However, as I look at this text, I think, does it say anything about death? Does it say anything that this was something as a prescription for a person's eternity based on a one choice that that man made? No. No. What kind of a darkness was he thrown into? 
Maybe it was a darkness of his regular life where the pain and the suffering is so great that you get swallowed up by it and you, you feel so lonely and invisible in your suffering that nothing else would describe this kind of a life but utter darkness. Maybe the life of this man had so many tragedies in it that the only physical response his body could give to the constant pain was weeping. Maybe he clenched his teeth so hard over and over and over again, trying to squeeze the pain from tearing the entire fabric of his life apart. We know those kind of circumstances. I work with people. I know your stories. I know how a split-second accident, how a phone call from a doctor's office, how a manila envelope with some paperwork could just steal away the dreams, the hope, and the whole desire to live, but you have no other choice. So you exist in something that could be described as utter darkness, and there is weeping, and there is gnashing of your own teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen, is how Jesus concludes the story. Well, what does that mean, chosen? What does that mean, chosen? Again, as I was growing up, I felt like I was sure who did the choosing. Are you? When we think of the story, who did the choosing? God was the one that said, go invite everyone. Bring everyone in. There is plenty for all. What kind of choosing was that? Well, the man was the one that did the choosing. So what about him? Are we going to leave him there, suffering? Is that the kind of God that you believe in, the God that gives us one chance, and then we are out? That's not the God we believe in. The God we believe in is the God who extends his grace over and over again, who extends his invitation over and over again. And we also believe in God who may be the only one who knows how to find someone who is drowning in utter darkness. We believe in God who has the power, not the violent power, but the power of grace to pull someone out of that darkness and invite them again. So Soren Kierkegaard, one day later in his life, woke up and just felt indescribable joy. And as a philosopher, he struggled because rationalizing was what he chose to do, trying to find the meaning in his life, but all he felt was joy. And he, when he pinpointed where is that feeling coming from, it came from him feeling, knowing in the deep, deep, deep soul that he is a man found and chosen by God. And so he wrote, reflecting on his faith and encouraging other Christians, saying, choose again and again with each new day to be a real self, an authentic person in relation to God. Abandon your calculated safety for a recklessness, wholehearted life of faith in Christ. Continue to become, grow, risk, take that radical leap of faith right now. Choose to do so. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, I thank you for the gift of your grace, for the gift of your forgiveness that is there all the times, for the fact that you do not change and your love to us cannot be separated from us, neither by the tragedies and pain of our life, nor by death. I thank you, God that you have found us, and you called us your faithful disciples, and you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power in the glory forever. Amen.
when Jesus was with his disciples, with the people that were faithfully following him to the best of their abilities. He was celebrating a holiday with them. He, they were sitting at the table. He took the bread. He blessed it. And then he broke it. He graciously gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body broken for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. In the end of the supper, he took the cup of wine. He blessed it, gave God thanks for it, and then looked around the table at the people he loved, at the people that he wanted to be at that table, and said, this cup is the blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it in remembrance of me. And so we do so. I invite right now ushers who will be serving the communion to come forward and prepare for the stations. Our ushers will be guiding you from the back of the sanctuary to the front to receive communion in the balcony. They will be guiding you to the station. Every single uh, station has a gluten-free option if that is what you choose. When you come forward, receive the bread, receive the juice. We use non-alcoholic grape juice not to exclude anyone. On your way out, please dispose of the cups and the trash cash cans on the side, the table is set, the meal is ready, come and be fed. Shadow, you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Come. 
coming after me. So all you won't kick down, now you won't tear down, coming after me. So shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Now, if you are a guest with us today, thank you so much for choosing to worship with us. Our volunteers here at the on-ramp are James and Ryan. They'll be happy to meet you, to greet you, to properly welcome you. And also, they have gifts for you. They even have gifts for your kids. Isn't that right? Yes, they do. So we do want you to properly welcome you to our church if you choose to stop by and say hi at our on-ramp. Also, I want to point out that Julie is right there by the Congregational Care Ministries. If you're a person that needs somebody to pray with you, today she'll be happy to do so just stay back after the worship service once everybody leaves you can have a sacred moment of prayer there with julie and now will you please receive this benediction let the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be always with you amen